Virginia, Senator Richard Black. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. Um, you Thank have a you. lot of experience in the military, formal, former uh, colonel, also was in the Marines. Uh, you've got a lot of insight into this. What, I mean, I feel like we're heading into a serious, serious world war, either that or a very, uh, a very, very cold war. Which one do you think it's going to be? Uh, my projection is that it will be a hot war. Uh, I think we have had this on the burner uh, since 2014 when uh, President Barack Obama, Obama authorized a coup that overthrew the elected government of Ukraine and installed a revolutionary junta. Afterwards, we began flooding them with uh, with uh, at very advanced weapons. We built up a very robust Ukrainian armed forces and, uh, and they commenced a war against the, the Russian speaking areas on the border, principally the Donbass Republic. And uh, there were 14,000 people who died before Russia ever got involved in the war. So they, Russia hated to get into this war and they delayed and delayed and delayed, and they tried to work out arrangements with NATO where NATO would would stop its its interference right up to the border. And but I think the decision, you know, decisions on war don't just come up spontaneously the way we think they do in the movies. They're they're usually ge geopolitical maneuvers that are planned sometimes decades in advance, but at least 10 years in advance. And I think this one was, and where it leads us now is we've seen this, this inevitable escalation where we debated, well, will we send, you know, certain weapons there? And we've gone from missiles and we've gone to HIMARS uh, guided rockets. And now we're up to tanks. It seems fairly clear to me we're going through this little two-step uh, propaganda movement where we're saying, well, we, we really don't want to send the jets, but other people want to send the jets. Eventually, we're going to send the jets. Uh, just just uh, last night, I ran across an article where Britain is going to provide advanced cruise missiles with a range of 180 miles so that these things can be put on the Russian border. We can actually uh, attack deep into Russia itself. And, you know, at, at a certain point you say, okay, what's the next thing? The next thing is tactical nuclear weapons. Yeah, so, um, you know, it seems to be easy for, for NATO, for Biden to march us towards a war with Russia when it's not near our soil. You know, it's not going to be fought on American soil. It's going to be over there. You're talking about launching missiles deep into Russia. Russia would be looking at potentially attacking Europe. Um, so, so that, you know, whenever we can get into a war, as long as it's somewhere else, right? That's what we've seen all throughout the Middle East. It was just somewhere yeah. else. So it doesn't really affect us over here. Um, what are the chances you think that it will escalate to a point where we're actually attacked here on U.S. soil? What would that look like? Would that mean China has to get involved or North Korea has to get involved and they're launching their missiles at us on the West Coast here where I am, which is very scary? Or, you know, how do you see that that playing out? Because it seems to me that if I were in Russia's position, for example, if I were looking at it from their strategic vantage point, I would think, the only way to prevent this is to is to make the other side also fear losing something serious. Uh, it seems to be yeah. the only way yeah. to stop the escalation. Yeah, your, your analysis is pretty good. The, look, uh, Great Britain has resisted invasion since the Norman Conquest, which was in 1050 or so, 1047. And... Uh, uh, even even Germany under Hitler could not cross 21 miles of English Strait. People have actually swum the you know the the good swimmers go across the English Channel. There are 5,000 miles between us and Russia. There are 6,000 miles between us and China. 
the only possibility, the only threat that we face from overseas is a thermonuclear threat. It is a genuine threat because I, I know there are people in, uh, in the Pentagon and, and elsewhere who think, well, if we launched a surprise attack, we could knock out all of their, all of their missiles and so forth. The problem is they now have hypersonic missiles that on a moment's notice can fly and they can actually uh, hit places in the United States, hit places in Europe. There, there is no defense because they fly at such a speed that there's nothing that can catch up with them. Also, we have, uh, we have Russian uh, submarines with carrying, you know, over a hundred missiles, uh, not missiles, but a hundred warheads. And they can rain down destruction on New York, on San Francisco, on Washington, D.C., and, uh, and of course, all of the capitals of Europe. Uh, they don't want to do this, uh, but we're pushing them further and further. And what's happening now is you've got a lot of very smart people in the Pentagon, in the State Department, and in London, NATO, but they're acting like lemmings where there's a feeling like, well, we can do this extraordinarily reckless thing, but you know, Joe and Sam and Kathy, they think it's okay. So I guess it's, everything is fine. And meanwhile, we're charging across a cliff like the lemmings. Everybody thinking, well, everybody else says it's okay. And, and the next thing you're over the cliff. It's, we have never faced a threat of thermonuclear war uh, that ever compared to this and i'm i'm including you know i i lived through the uh through the uh cuban missile crisis i actually saw troops moving through the state of florida to go and invade cuba so i know what it is uh and, and i used to you know i used to cover myself in when i was a little boy we'd jump under the desks and we'd cover ourselves what we're faced today the american people are totally unaware of it it is it is a hundred times more dangerous than what we encountered back when i was a little boy it's genuine and we keep pushing the line further and further what do you think the agenda is um who is behind wanting to push this line where if this has been decided as you say a decade ago 2014 they were really deciding on, okay, we're gonna march ourselves towards a war with Russia. What would be the reason for it? I think there's a desire to weaken Russia. Um, I think there are certain, certain global interests, there are global oligarchs who, who look with tremendous interest at the enormous wealth of, uh, of Russia. Uh, Russia has, uh, natural resources that are beyond our, our wildest dreams. Um, few people are aware of the enormous uh, exports of natural resources. They're the number one exporter of lumber, of wheat, of fertilizer, of natural gas. They're huge exporters of oil, of aluminum, it just goes on and on, cobalt, manganese, all sorts of things. And there are people who say, look, you know, if I could, if I could somehow get control or get a big interest in the, in the oil or the gas or the lumber, I could be a trillionaire. And I think some of those people have an influence over the American government. Uh, it's it's uh, the American people get nothing we get absolutely nothing from this. We get the bills. We're, we're the bill payers, uh, but uh, but we get nothing out of it. It doesn't serve any any legitimate national interest of the United States to be involved in the war. Right. Yeah. Well, especially if we start sending over troops and we're going to be, um, you know, and then we've got uh, coffins coming home. It's not. I, I don't know why they would think that this is a good idea. Part of me thinks that this isn't really going to happen, that this is actually sort of um, that that he, that Russia and the United States are sort of in on it. You know, there's there's kind of a question about even the Cold War 
that the USSR and the United States sort of manufactured the Cold War in order to have the arms race and, and a space race. I mean, it was just really good for industry fundamentally without even having to fire a shot. And so there's kind of this thinking that maybe we're sort of just redoing the same play where it's, yeah, we're amping up rhetoric, making it sound like there's going to be a real true war. I mean, clearly there is an actual war going on in Ukraine, but this the idea that, that NATO's really truly going to get involved, it's really just a matter of escalating really for industry, really for kind of, you know, forces that we don't really fully understand, um, ha you know, great reset or something that is trying to march us towards a different place and that this is all just theater. I, I, I don't know if, you know, or, or because it's just so hard to, it's hard to grasp why there would be any sort of hot war, what the benefit of a hot war would be with Russia or even China for that matter. They keep talking about going in, you know, threatening China or posturing against China because of Taiwan. And, you know, this just really remains a question. What is the actual benefit these days? If you're not going to, if you're not looking to conquer land, you know, back in the, back in the days, I mean, it was, you go to war because you're trying to take something. But now, mm -hmm. are they really truly trying to, is there a thinking that they're going to actually take Russia or actually take China? I mean, I just don't see how that's a possibility. So it just feels to me like this is all just escalating theater in order to boost up certain industries and march towards certain agendas that we can't quite, leaving us distracted with running around thinking, oh no, nuclear war, nuclear war, and really they've got something else up their sleeve. Well, I think if you listen to President Biden, earlier in his uh, presidency, he seemed almost disinterested in things that were happening. He has a passion for this war. And you listen to his, his the, uh, the speech that you just played. This is not a guy who is just uh, playing games. He is, he is very genuine about it. And he, he's hoping to hold together this NATO coalition, which, you know, these guys over in Europe, they're very nervous about what's going on, but uh, they're all afraid to, uh, to stand up to the United States. I, I really worry that uh, it is genuine that it's not it's not some sort of a stage presentation but it's something that is genuine that has gotten beyond what any one person is likely to control uh we we seem to be headed you know i'd like to tell you that wars are totally rational but you can go back i think a good example is what happened with World War I. Uh, historians still debate over who was to blame, how the war started, but it started with the assassination of the Austrian uh, uh, Archduke and his wife. And in the end, 14 million people were dead at the end of First World War. And the stage was set for the Second World War that killed another 50 million. This started with two people. And uh, I think here, we're, we're taking steps of phenomenal recklessness. Let me just give you an example. The United States was involved in sinking the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Moskva, named after the, the capital of Russia. 300 young sailors went to the bottom. We probably fired the missiles. We probably controlled them ourselves. We targeted 13 senior Russian field generals for assassination, helped to kill them along working with the Ukrainians. We went beyond, and uh, from what I can tell, there was a, there was a drone attack that uh, was launched that went deep into Russia and actually damaged some of their nuclear carrying jet aircraft, some of their nuclear uh, powered or, or, or uh, capable bombers. So this was part of their defensive triad. Uh, we, we have various people. We have the, the chairman of the House Foreign Relations Committee who recently agreed with a crazy general who 
made the comment that we're going to be at war with China by 2025. Now, this is the chairman of the, the House Foreign Relations Committee. This isn't just some off-the-wall character. And yet he's saying, well, you know, there's some merit to what this general says. We seem to be determined to, to drive our car at 100 miles an hour into a bridge abutment. We're just, we're just aiming for it, and we're, we got our pedal to the metal. It's a bizarre time. I've, I've never experienced it. I've followed uh, foreign affairs for about 70 years since I was a little boy. I had a fascination with it, and I've never seen us in a situation like we are today. So you think we're headed into not only war with Russia, a hot war, but also one with China as well? I think so. I, and uh, the, the strategy behind that is... It, it is absolute madness. If you wanted to take down these two big nuclear powers, you would do them one at a time. We, for whatever reason, we've got the ball rolling. Uh, we've decided to take them both down simultaneously. And uh, it, it, it is a terrible strategy uh, for a lot of reasons, but militarily, just, a, just purely militarily, it's a it's a bizarre strategy, but we're in a we're in a time when rational people are not controlling events. Right. Uh, you know, I've always said that uh, unlike some countries, you, you take Russia, uh, President Putin is kind of the ultimate authority. He, you know, obviously everybody has input, but ultimately he makes the decision. In the United States, and particularly with NATO involved too, there is no central organizing intellect behind foreign policy, behind Western foreign policy. It is sort of an amorphous moving blob that's constantly shifting. And you would like to think that there's somebody who can simply turn off the, the switch and say, okay, we're, we're shutting this monster down but it's not clear that there is. Uh, if we were to go into this hot war from your perspective, would we win? No, um, there would be, the United States would be devastated to the point where perhaps 60% perhaps of the population would die uh, within, within the period of a month. Um, Western Europe would be very similar. Uh, London would simply be uninhabitable for the next thousand years. Same thing with New York City, with Washington, D.C. Um, there would be places that would be spared. Africa would be spared. Uh, there would be perhaps areas of, of Asia, uh, perhaps Latin America. But uh, Western civilization would die in a nuclear war. And uh, I don't know that it matters to some of the people making the decisions today. It's, it's a little bit eerie to watch it taking place. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And scary, scary that they wouldn't care. Um, scary that they would march us towards us and that they just, you know, for whatever their purpose is, um, it just is absolutely frightening. So... Uh, I mean, hopefully we can stop it. Is there any way, do you think, that, you know, it just feels, we feel powerless, quite frankly. You know, it just doesn't feel like there's anything we the people can do. Even if the polls show the American people are increasingly becoming less interested in funding the war in Ukraine, it doesn't seem to matter to the politicians. They seem to double down. And then you get the Republicans in the House now, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, a lot of them have been saying no more money for the war in Ukraine. But then they suddenly change their tune when they get there, or they're really posturing hard against China. So they say, oh, no war, no money for war against Ukraine, but we'd happily fund it if we were going to be protecting Taiwan from China. So it just feels like there's no hope for us, we the people. What, from your perspective, can we do? Well, you know, it is, it is a bipartisan effort. Now, there is a block of, uh, there are a block of uh, Republican members of the House who are very 
concerned about the war and very opposed to it. But these are not the senior people. These are the younger people. They, they're not the ones who sit on as chairman of committees. So uh, th there is not, there's not a block of resistance. In the, in the Democratic Party, there also was a group that actually sent a letter calling for an end to the war. Uh, there were 30 of them, and they sent it to President Biden, and they revoked it the day following yeah. <coughs> its delivery. <coughs> so um, I, think, I think what we need to do is just through people like you, we need to get the word out uh, what the level, level of danger is, and that uh, uh, there's, no, there's no sense from the American perspective, there is the American people have nothing to gain from this war, not a single thing. And uh, somehow people have to wake up to it or, yeah. or they may discover that we lose everything. Uh, Senator Dick Black, thank you so much for being here. Also, Colonel Dick Black, thank you for being here um, and giving us your insight. I know you give a lot of insight on your weekly podcast that people can tune into, but um, you know, scary, I, I, scary analysis, quite honestly, but needed to hear for sure. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kim.